as a radio talk show host, if I go on the air and do a commercial and lie, or tell a story and lie about a person, I could be sued. If a politician does a political ad and lies or uses profanity, we're not allowed to edit it. We have to air that. Is that a broadcast policy or is that a constitutional protection that candidates can say whatever they want even if it's not true? It's, it's kind of a reflection of political reality. I mean, what, what authority in the United States would surveil statements by politicians for their truthfulness? Whoever that is would be the busiest person on the planet. <laughs> and we pretty much thrown up our hands and said, let the voters decide if they think a politician is lying. They may like the person even though the person has told a lie. But the general rule of thumb is that for public figures, that would be you and me, that would be anybody who works in front of a microphone or a camera, it would be anybody running for office, it would be anybody whose name is well known. Uh, A-Rod is a public figure, even though he doesn't run for office and doesn't work in front of, a, strictly speaking, a camera or a microphone. Any uh, public figure, the law is the following. You can say anything you want about that person unless you know what you're saying is false and say it anyway or unless you are reckless in your concern for whether it is true or false. That is pretty much the rule of thumb. But in a political campaign, particularly a presidential campaign, it is almost inconceivable that the courts would hear a defamation action of one politician against another. A, we expect them to lie. B, the remedy for lying is rejection by the voters. Now, I'll give you another example where the courts have condoned lying. And this gets us back to Mrs. Clinton. Mrs. Clinton will soon be faced with the following very, very difficult choice. When the US prosecutors working with the 147 FBI agents assigned to investigate her call up her lawyer and say, we have all of this evidence here. What do you want us to do with it? What do you mean, what do you want us to do with it? Well, do you want us to present it to a grand jury or do you want to give us your version of it? Basically, will your client, Hillary Rodham Clinton, come in and talk to us? That is an awful choice for her to make. Because if she does go in and talk to them, they can lie to her, legally. She cannot lie to them, even though she won't be under oath. This is the Martha Stewart case. Martha Stewart is having a conversation in an FBI office with her lawyer. And her lawyer says to the FBI agent, is my client under investigation? And the FBI agent says, no, it was a lie. Then they asked Mrs. Stewart questions, and she told two, two lies. Did the FBI agent get prosecuted? No, he got a promotion. Did she get prosecuted? Yes, she did. Was she under oath? No, she was not under oath. So in an official conversation, not talking about in a restaurant or at a or, or, or at a ball game, but in an official conversation where the FBI is conducting an investigation, if you lie to the FBI, you can be prosecuted. So Mrs. Clinton will then be faced with the following choice. Does she go in or doesn't she? The, the prudent advice that criminal lawyers give their clients is don't go in there. Don't talk to them because you don't know what they know. They can lie to you. They can trick you. And if you, if you give an answer inconsistent with something else you've said, they're going to prosecute you for it. Now, her lawyer, she's a lawyer. Her lawyer is uh, David Petraeus's lawyer, so he's dealt with this before. Same lawyer representing both. Um, I don't know whether she's going to go in or not, but I do know that she has said, I can't wait to talk to the FBI. <laughs> Everybody can wait to talk to the FBI. <laughs> So if she does not go in there, they will leak the fact that when she said she couldn't wait to talk to us, she lied because she refused to come in. And if she does go in there, they will leak whatever she tells them that is inconsistent with what they know the evidence to be. Either way, she will lose. I think one of the reasons, Judge, that you're so admired by viewers, listeners, and readers is that you look at issues and you're not laden partisan to one side all the time. And here's an example. Sometimes I get my fingers burnt. <laughs> with, with respect to President Bush, President Obama, their handling of civil liberties on the war on terror, you've been a strong critic. 
I take you to your book, Suicide Pact. You delivered some criticism of the actions of both presidents yes. and their parties with respect to torture, domestic spying, surveillance, the like. Well, George uh, W. Bush argued that he could arrest people without charge, keep them incarcerated uh, without uh, talking to a lawyer, and uh, torture them into speaking to his agents. Barack Obama has argued that he can kill Americans without indicting them, without charging them, without asking them to come in, without even pursuing them. So you can see how this has gone from, from very, very bad to horrific. All of these things are a violation uh, of the Constitution. Again, the Constitution protects persons. Doesn't matter if that person was arrested in Afghanistan and is now in Guantanamo Bay. The government doesn't escape the Constitution by going to Cuba, wherever the government goes. The Constitution, which is supposed to regulate the government, uh, goes. As well, this guy, Anwar Alaki, not a nice guy, although he was invited by Donald Rumsfeld in the week after 9-11 to, to speak to troops at, at the Pentagon, and he did that, nevertheless was sitting in a cafe in Yemen when a drone zapped him, as well as his 16-year-old son, also an American, the 16-year-old son's 16-year-old friend, also an American, and uh, President Obama said he could do that because it was too difficult to arrest them. Arrest them for what? They hadn't even been charged with anything. They were also being surveilled in the final 48 hours of their life, lives by 16 intelligence agents who were never more than a quarter of a mile away from them who could have arrested them, except it would have been illegal to arrest them because they hadn't been charged with anything. So the present president says he can kill Americans who haven't even been charged with anything. His predecessor said he can lock up Americans and throw away the key and not charge them with anything. Every time the Bush administration went to the Supreme Court, they lost. The Obama administration has not been to the Supreme Court on, on these issues. Mr. Al-Awlaki's father brought an action against the president to enjoin the president from killing his son. Justice Department lawyer said, what are you, crazy? The president doesn't kill people? Federal judge said to uh, Alaki's father, who's a professor, Professor, are you out of your mind? You really think that President Obama's going to kill people? I'm throwing this case out of court. Two weeks later, the son was killed by a drone. Now there's another litigation suing the president for murdering the son. We'll see where it goes. Two years ago, February 2014, I'm watching you on Fox News, and you surprised me, but you made it clear. Um, you are a contrarian, I think your words. I am a contrarian on Abraham Lincoln. Yes. Why? Because I don't think the Civil War was necessary. I don't think it was necessary to kill 750,000 uh, people. I don't think the goal of the Civil War was to uh, eradicate slavery. I think the decision to eradicate slavery came about by way of a military uh, gesture halfway through the Civil War. The government could very well have condemned the slaves as you condemn property and bought them from the slave owners without killing 750,000 people. Because Lincoln's uh, soldiers uh, killed civilians, raped women, robbed banks, burnt courthouses, and uh, they all got away with it. And I don't think any of it uh, was necessary. No, I say that as a person who was a fierce opponent of slavery, whether based on, on race or not, but there would have been easier, better, faster, more efficient, less violent ways to have achieved that. Lincoln's goal, in my view, was to strengthen the federal government by making it a crime for the states to undo what they had voluntarily done, join the union. Give us a little about Justice Scalia, your thoughts. Well, he was a very dear uh, friend of mine. He was uh, funny, combative, uh, witty, uh, short-tempered, Im impatient with those who disagreed with him, uh, usually the smartest person uh, in the room. I uh, many, many meals with him. We vacationed uh, together. There were times when uh, Mrs. Scalia had to uh, separate us, not, not physically, but sort of uh, verbally at the dinner table because we were disagreeing uh, over so many things. Um, well, a lot of funny things happened. So he and I are, are seated in a restaurant together having lunch. <laughs> this is almost embarrassing in Washington, D.C., and there are four uh, 
well-dressed gentlemen a couple tables over, and they come over, and they announce that they are lawyers from Minnesota. And before he can say anything or I can say anything, they look at me and they go, Judge, we loved what you did on Fox and Friends this morning. <laughs> I'm going, this is Justice Scalia who's on the Supreme Court. And they're going like, hi, and what is Megyn Kelly really like? <laughs> And when they left, he says to me, are these people from the moon? <laughs> and then he looks at me, this typical Nino Scalia, if you set that up, I'll kill you. <laughs> oh, I didn't set this up. These guys, I don't know who these people are. They're more interested in talking to me about Megyn Kelly than you about the Supreme Court. So Justice Scalia and I did a program like this one-on-one uh, -on -one in front of a couple of thousand people at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and Mrs. Uh, Scalia and he stayed at uh, the University Club, a lovely private facility in uh, New York City. And when I brought them there, I said, this library is gorgeous here, and it's open 24-7. So any member or guest can come anytime and take a book out of the library. Well, about three weeks later, he calls me up. Remember you told me about the library? Yes. Well, I couldn't sleep, so I went down there. When did you go down there? Well, it was 1.30 in the morning. I was wearing my slippers, my bathrobe, and pajamas. Oh my God. <laughs> Somebody sees you at 1.30 in the morning in the library dressed like that, they'll think you were a ghost. Well, I, I found a book and I enjoyed it. And I brought it back to the room and I started to sleep and I started to read and I fell asleep. All right, well, how does this concern me, Nina? Yeah. Well, well, let me finish. I'll tell you how it concerns you. <laughs> While I was shaving the next morning, Maureen packed the book. Where's the book now? Staring me in the face. It's right here in the court. What do you want me to do with it? What do I want you to do with it? I want you to sneak it back in that library. <laughs> well, let me get this straight, Nino. You're a justice of the Supreme Court. I'm a TV guy who thrives on these kind of things. You want me to sneak this book back in the library? You're goddamn right. I don't want you to tell anybody. <laughs> I'm so the screen on my phone shows the name of who's calling, and I see my Princeton buddy and Fox News colleague, John Stossel. What the hell is he calling me up for? His office is two doors away. Johnny, oh, Judge, I got to be on O'Reilly tonight, and I don't want to go on. Can you take the gig? <laughs> what, are you crazy? You want me to show up down there instead of you? They, they'll, they'll ban me, and they'll ban you. Why don't you want to go on? because he wants me to talk about drones. I don't know anything about drones. I said, well, Johnny, can I give you some information about drones? Can I give you some of the columns that I've written? I'm just a consumer reporter. I don't know anything about drones. Johnny, I'll send you my columns. So I sent him the links. He reads them. He calls me back about an hour later. He goes, OK, OK, I see now. The president can't kill people. You're entitled to due process. Only the Congress can declare war. OK, I get it, I get it. But Something weird is going to happen. I don't want to go on that show tonight. Can you show up instead of me? What are you, crazy? No, I can't show up instead of you. I go home, I go to bed. I'm not going to watch O'Reilly at 8 o'clock at night. The next morning I come in, I, Johnny, what happened? He said, well, you're not going to believe what happened. I go down there in the studio, no O'Reilly. No O'Reilly? Yeah, there was a camera there. There was a sound technician. There was a camera operator. O'Reilly was before a live studio audience of 500 people in Los Angeles. And my face, this is Stossel, was on a screen, 10 times life size. <laughs> so O'Reilly starts, all right, Stossel, what's wrong with the drones? They kill the bad people, they save the good people. Half the time, so we don't even know what the hell's happening. <laughs> yes, Bill, but under the Constitution, we're entitled to due process. If the government wants life, liberty, or property, it has to either declare war or sue us. That's the law of the land. Otherwise, Bill, they could use a drone on you. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Stossel. Did you get these arguments from Judge Napolitano? And, and John goes, well, as a matter of fact, I did. O'Reilly goes, big deal. He's not on the Supreme Court. The best he can do is Fox and Friends. Yeah. <laughs>